we're on the Holy Spirit. This will be lesson three. Today, we're going to talk about the question we had at the end of last week, especially since the question asker is here. And I may have you, do you remember your question from last week? Yeah, the soul and the spirit and the why there is the soul and the spirit. Why was the soul created? Is that sort of your question? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm going to talk about, I think, the, the view of why God made the soul of persons, soul of people, and why that matters, why that was an Old Testament deal and a New Testament deal, and try to put that together at, in the context of the Holy Spirit. So today is Holy Spirit Lesson 3, which will be the soul and the spirit. And uh, we'll start from there. I just want a little reminder to you that if you ask a question, I'll just point at you because we're not putting names on the tape for now until, you know, I guess, well, probably never. And then, um, so we're, and so it's nothing to be rude. It's just to be efficient with the uh, permissions for having people on the tape. And then um, as we go through the lesson, I am happy to entertain questions as always, always. I'd just like to ask that you keep it focused on our lesson. We're uh, limited in time. And last week I accidentally let us out somewhere around 11 seconds late. And I'm very sensitive to that. So I'll try, try to keep us on track. So today's trivia question is, when there was writing on the wall, what prominent king died that night? And I will say, because I want to clarify, there could have been a lot of kings who died that night in history, and I didn't have time to check that out. So we'll go with the one that's in Scripture. So what king in Scripture died the night of Meany, Meany, Tickle, you Parson being written, written on the wall? And then keep in mind, you know, it's in the Bible. If you know where that story is, it's very easy to find. And that's my feeling of what Bible trivia is for, is to get you looking at Scripture and trying to think, hey, I remember that story pertains to this character, therefore must be at this stage of history or this book. And that is, in this case, I think, pretty straightforward because you know who interpreted that for him. What? Belshazzar. Belshazzar, yes, we have a winner. Thank you, that was King Belshazzar. So let's look at Daniel 5 because he knew that Daniel was the one who interpreted the writing on the wall during the reign of Belshazzar, not to be confused with Daniel himself, who was called Belteshazzar, which is kind of an interesting connection, I think. So King Belshazzar was um, the probably the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebonidas was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar is probably the grandson of, Belsha of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebonidus was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not sure if I said that right. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebonidus, which I haven't spelled out yet, but I will. Nebonidus, uh, which I'm probably mispronouncing because I've never met him personally, is N-A-B-O-N-I-D-U-S. And he is also known as what I believe is one of the best names in the Bible for a non-Christian character, which is Evil Merodach. So he was also known as Evil Merodach. And then he had the son, Belshazzar. So King Belshazzar, Daniel 5, 1, gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, gave orders, et cetera. And uh, to use it well here, it's kind of important. I guess the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar's father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So that was offending to God, offensive to God. And so that was uh, probably one of many sins that led to the writing on the wall, meaning, meaning, Tico, you parson, or meaning, meaning, Tico, parson, uh, which is later in the chapter, and we won't cover at the moment. I just, I mentioned that to also mention at chapter six, verse one, if you're at Daniel, look at six, one, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. That's what led to the jealousy that led to Daniel being thrown into the den of lions. And if you look down at verse 30, right before that, or 29, 
At Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck. He is proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 60, 62. And so I do want to mention also, in addition to each of those, I think it's, it's interesting to um, look at that. Verse, chapter 6, verse 28, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So Darius was the Mede, Cyrus was the Persian, Persian, not Persian, that word doesn't exist, it, the, the Persian. And um, those were actually probably the same person in two different cultures, the Medes and the Persians having different language. And, I, and then there's King Belshazzar and there's Belteshazzar, who was Daniel. And all of these things kind of combined to be a challenge for translators. We were talking last week about how the Old Testament uh, was all in existence by about 250 BC and that there were, you know, some vowels don't appear in Hebrew language. And then when you combine like the Mede approach, the Persian approach, the Babylonian uh, exile that the Israelites are in, the renaming of individuals, the different names for individuals, it's very challenging at times to put that together. On the other hand, we know that Darius became king when he was 62. In what other history is that kind of detail available? And I think it's amazing how God gives us the detail that is just incredibly uh, precise and also can be documented in history very well. So all those things are very uh, valuable, I think. So we're talking about the question on the Holy Spirit about why God created the soul and the being of mankind. Why is that different than the rest of creation and how does that play a role in lives? I think that's my paraphrase of the question. And I hope that's close enough to to discuss. Is that still fair from a minute ago? Okay, I'm impressed. Both of us remember from last week. And the reason I remember is I read the transcript Johnny wrote out for me. So anyway, the <laughs> it's, um, oh, I didn't use the name Johnny, did I? It'll see me after for, yeah, thank you. All right, so that or we'll just wipe you out from his, well, never mind. We wouldn't want to do that. Um, so when we look at the creation story and the breath of life, let's look back at Genesis 2. And we will see if my eyebrows are a little messed up, it's because I was holding Chandler during services. She got caught up in them, kind of stuck there for a minute. All right, so Genesis 2. Uh, seven, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit being present at uh, pre-creation, where the Holy Spirit was above the, uh, the formless void earth. Uh, chapter 1, verse 2, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then the Spirit of God being the breath of God, you know, we talked about pneumologos being the term that was used for breath of the truth, the word of truth, the breath of God, the absolute truth and the wind of God, if you will, is kind of another way of looking at it, being breathed into mankind to uh, create him differently than the rest of the creatures. And um, of course, there's the famous talk to about, you know, let us make God, uh, make man, excuse me, let us make man in our image, that was at uh, verse 26 of chapter one, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, over all creatures moving along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. So I believe if you look at the history of the Bible, the story of the Bible, in the context of creation of the soul, I think it all makes sense as a big picture view of what the Holy Spirit does for us. So that's what we're going to go through today. So when God first created man, you know, he had this special relationship with Adam and Eve. And then, of course, sin entered the picture through the deceit of Satan about you can be like God if you eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. 
and uh, of uh, knowledge of good and evil. And then when they ate, Eve first, then Adam, God had them separated from the garden. And then later, of course, there were a bunch of people around that began to sin. Getting down to Genesis 6, it says that God was uh, grieved that he had even created man because he found nothing but evil. The intent of man was nothing but evil. And then, of course, he found Noah to be the righteous man. And he delivered Noah in the ark and through the process of water. And, of course, over in First Peter, we read about how the uh, water uh, from Noah and the ark and the way that he was saved is representative of washing sin away and uh, in the analogy of that comparison to baptism there with the water and the salvation uh, to bring about righteousness in the world again, to reset, to die to what the world was and to live again. Then after the story of Noah, of course, sin naturally was present in the world because there still were people involved. And so uh, everyone falls short of the glory of God and sin. So in that process, sin re-entered into the history of mankind. And then the story of Abraham came about where Abram first, his name was first Abram, uh, came out of the land of the Chaldeans, came over to the promised land that we later knew as Canaan at the time was just the land promised to Abram. And then God's uh, view on Abram and his line was to have him wait for the blessing, I believe, of having a son. He promised him a son. Yeah, and as you know, Sarah laughed and Abram didn't, Abraham didn't really understand how that could come about. And in that process, he was then eventually blessed with the son Isaac, which the name means he laughs, which I think is interesting. And then there was a little bit of a pause to the next generation where Jacob became the leader of Israel, the father of Israel. His name was changed to Israel because of that. But Isaac was sort of almost like a, uh, a, a uh, place taker there. I can't think of the right word for that, but he was sort of the interim there to show God's love for the people because Abraham was to take him up and sacrifice him and took him up, uh, you know, three days journey. And he found the mountain that he was to sacrifice him on, took him up all the way to tying him up and having the knife ready. And then God intervened and provided the substitutionary sacrifice. Very Christ-like view of having a substitute die in place of the person for the forgiveness of sins in, that, in the future case. There, it's not quite as clear about forgiveness of sins, but it was for fulfillment of the covenant to Abraham. So when then, if we fast forward a little more, the nation of Israel coming out of the slavery where they were taught patience and endurance, and Moses came back to show them through the spokesman Aaron that God is the one true God. They received the 10 commandments. They got impatient. That process broke the commandments. Aaron led the nation to form the gold idol that, uh, you know, they famously then had to grind up and drink because they had sinned against God himself at the mountain of God himself. And then with, with the Ten Commandments establishing that God is the one true God and only he should be worshipped and no graven image and, you know, no lies, no murder, respect for marriage respect for each other essentially is what the Ten Commandments boiled down to. Then the nation was taken to the brink of Canaan and they, uh, Joshua, or excuse me, Moses sent in the spies, including Joshua and Caleb. We forget the other 10 names because they felt that, the, that God would not give them the land. It was too significant to overcome. And then um, Joshua and Caleb said, you know, we could do this, but God said, well, with 10 saying no, to saying, yes, you're going to ride it out in the desert for 40 years and then be blessed. And only Joshua and Caleb were able to enter the land. You know all that. And going up to Deuteronomy 27 and 28, God gave them the list of promises and the list of curses if they first obeyed God and everything he did or if they denied God and didn't serve him. And of course, all through that, he emphasized that it was absolutely to be an elimination of all false gods, all other peoples, only God's people in the land of Israel, and he would bless them. And in that blessing, 
they would have absolute peace. Their enemies would flee from them. They would be blessed with plentiful food. They'd be able to rest on the Sabbath every week. They'd be able to have a Sabbath year every seventh year. They'd be able to have a year of jubilee every 50th year where everyone could rest and forgive and be freed and live in God's blessing. And they could not attain that because they could not keep from sin with the other uh, influences in their community, which were false gods, other people trying to lead them astray from that. Then if we go to Ezekiel, and I want you to turn to Ezekiel, mainly because I don't think we turn there much and I feel like you need the exercise. So if you go to Ezekiel, I'm going to go to chapter um, one first and it, because, you know, it's a good place to start. And then we'll read a few excerpts. So bear with me here for a moment while I read through this, a uh, few verses. So yeah, the um, chapter one, I'll go ahead and start verse one, Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles in the Kibar River, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. So this is Ezekiel at the, near the end of the time of the exile of the Israelites into uh, Babylonian hands. And of course, they were sent there by God because they had sinned so frequently. You know, the story of Israel was always, you know, uh, God tells them to follow him. They follow him for a little bit at a point of convenience and then they quit following him and turn against him and rebel he punishes them and then they turn back to him and eventually he just sent them out of the land of canaan because they had sent so much yes where were the israelites or where was the kibar river oh and for reading Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1 is what I read. I'm sorry, I can't quite. Ezekiel, Old Testament, like Ezekiel, Daniel. I can't quite hear you, I'm sorry. But yeah, Ezekiel 1 is where I'm reading from. Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. So he was on the Kibar River, which is over in the land of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the then Medes and Persians, as they all took over the land. And on the fifth of the month, this is Ezekiel 1, 2. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi. You know, I'm sorry. I think I said it was early. It was late in the exile. I meant to say it was early in the exile. This was early word of God of how to establish yourself again as a kingdom for God. So uh, in the fifth year of the uh, exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was upon him. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. Okay, this windstorm is reflective of the term for the breath of God. This, the wind that came in wasn't just you know, a northern wind, an easter wind. It came, seemed to come from everywhere because it was the presence of God, which we also refer to as the Holy Spirit, the pneumo logos, the Holy Spirit of God. And then I'll uh, skip over the several faces, cherubim and the wheels within the wheel, although I think it is fascinating, but, you know, that's a whole different lesson. Then uh, down to verse 28, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rain, rainy day, so was the radiance around this one present there who was God. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. I heard the voice of one speaking. Chapter 2, verse 1, he said to me, son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the spirit came into me and raised me to my feet and I heard him speaking to me. Okay, so the spirit of the Lord was there, uh, the Holy Spirit, guiding Ezekiel on this. Now, I'm going to turn a few verses, a few uh, chapters over to chapter 10. So turn with me there. I looked, 10.1, Ezekiel 
I looked and I saw the likeness of the throne of sapphire above the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim. The Lord said to the man clothed in linen, go among the wheels beneath the cherubim, etc." And I'm going to have you uh, read that later if you want to read more about it. But I'm going to go down to verse 18. The glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings, rose from the ground. As they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the Lord of, uh, God of Israel, the, the glory of the God of Israel was above them. And then down to verse uh, chapter 11, verse 1, the spirit lifted me up and brought me to the gate of the house of the Lord that faces east. Verse 5, the spirit of the Lord came upon me to say this is what the Lord says. Uh, this is, that is what you're saying, the old house of Israel, but I know what's going through your mind. You've killed many people in the city, filled streets with the dead, etc. And then, so notice how much we're mentioning the glory of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord coming into it, uh, Ezekiel. So I'm going to uh, pause there for a second to mention something else. And we'll take that up at Ezekiel 37. If you want to put a finger in to uh, there or hold that spot. We'll be back at Ezekiel 37. So when we start looking at the terminology used for glory of the Lord and the wind the breath of God, the spirit of God that was over the formless and void earth pre-creation, and then the breath of God that was breathed into Adam and Eve, and the uh, various that, you know, I obviously skipped a lot of history there, uh, talking about the, um, just the, the process of the God, of God's people and learning how to deal with God. If you look at the cloud by day, the fire by night that led the Israelites, and then look at the wind coming in to Ezekiel in the story of Ezekiel, and the glory of the Lord over the temple, all those terms have that same root to pneumo logos, or the breath of God, the breath of truth, the breath of absolute truth, the breathed word of God, any way you want to interpret that, I think is fair within that context of this was uh, literally the breath of God with truth. I don't know how to define that more closely because the Hebrew terms are a little complicated for us and the interpretation. And English doesn't always lend itself to exact representations of other language in history. But the closest we can say is the breath of the Lord that is truth and, or something very, very similar to that. That is the same as over in John chapter one, when God says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word was truth, the word was God, the word was with God. I just quote that backwards. But anyway, it does all mean the same thing about the breath of God being fulfilled in Jesus Christ then at that moment. So when we look at that breath of God, that is the remarkably similar Hebrew word to the breath that was given into Adam and then Eve to breathe life into him, and the cloud by day, the fire by night that led the people of Israel. I skipped over that God's presence came to the tabernacle uh, that was built in the desert by Moses in Exodus 48, says that the presence of God filled that holy of holies so brilliantly that even Moses couldn't be in there, and only the high priest could approach it once a year to offer sacrifice. And so God dwelt between the cherubim. That term for God dwelling between the cherubim is the same as the glory of God that departed from the temple there in Ezekiel 10 that I just read. Now, having said all that, I want to mention Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. This is one of those stories that I think people love to mention. You know, the, the story of saying there is a valley of dry bones appears in songs. You know, it appears in various uh, forms. I think when we talk about stories of the Old Testament, oh, there's this valley of dry bones that came to life. But how much have we really read that and looked at? We're going to do that today. 
Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord, out by, excuse me, out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. I'm going to read this fairly quickly. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That this is what the sovereign Lord says to the bones. I will make breath enter you. And you will come to life. Well, there's that term about breath from God giving life, the Holy Spirit. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you skin. I'll put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I'm the Lord. Now, I want to emphasize no one translates this as the Holy Spirit in terms of in place of the breath of God. But the breath of God is how we get the term Holy Spirit. And only God can give life. You can build something, you can mold something, you can cook something, you can grow something, but if you don't start with a living facet, you cannot give that item life. Only God can give life. And that's the term that he's using there for a creator, Holy Spirit, let us think about the reflecting on, let us make man in our image, for instance. So verse seven, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them, skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. So just a couple of thoughts about the breath of God there. One is it came from the four winds. You know, if, you, if you've ever been in wind, I'll assume you have, but there, uh, there's always a direction. You know, it may seem like it comes from everywhere, but it swirls, or it comes this way, maybe then blows that way or whatever, but this was from all sides at once, it appears, by radiant, the breath that came and appeared in the slain so that they could live. Then he said to me, verse 11, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring it bring you up from them i'll bring you back to the land of israel then you my people will know that i'm the lord when i open your graves and bring you up from them i will put my spirit in you well there's that term spirit again in you and you will live i will settle you in your own land then you will know that i the lord have spoken and i have done it declares the lord so the story of dry bones was the story of restoration through the Holy Spirit, of salvation through the Holy Spirit. And not only did he say he would allow them to live like we look at eternal life, I would suggest, but that they could live in their land they had been promised to them uh, with their covenant with God that they continually broke. I might suggest that when we look at the description of heaven, whether in Ezekiel or in Revelation, it's always talked about being like the city of Jerusalem. Now, I'm not saying we're going to go all, you know, pick up today and go over and rebuild Israel and establish a kingdom there. That is not the point of the lesson. The point is that as God had promised this land to the Israelites, the land of Canaan, to be the land of milk and honey where they'd have no enemies, no strife, no starvation, no problems, because they are following God's will. That sure does sound like the description of heaven, that you follow God's will and you're rewarded with complete safety, life, influence of God through that, um, uh, being able to dwell with him uh, by his throne there in heaven. So let me, because we're running up against the clock a bit here, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. To, and I do want to point out there that uh, 
in Ezekiel, if you continue reading, you would find that uh, the, the glory of God, the spirit of God that was lifted up from the temple and left because the, the description was because the armies of Nebuchadnezzar were coming in to raid the temple and take every item from the temple. That was in Ezekiel 10 and 11. Then out uh, a few couple of chapters after what we just read in 37, I think it's in chapter 42. I apologize if you pull off there. But later in Ezekiel, uh, there was the building of Ezekiel's temple and the restoration of the glory of God there. That was a vision because it wasn't coming about during the exile. But the vision of Ezekiel was that God would build a larger, more glorious temple and reoccupy that temple. Now, if we fast forward a bit to Matthew chapter 3, this is actually fast forwarding quite a bit, but we'll do it. So I'm going to go to verse 13 of Matthew 3. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Let it be so now, Jesus replied. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This was the reappearance of the breath of God, spirit of God descending like a dove. I don't think anybody can be sure whether that was a literal dove, frankly. I think it's very hard in all descriptions in the Bible, very difficult to explain what the presence of God looks like. And that, in fact, going back to Ezekiel, and when he says the heavens were open, now I saw the throne of God, that's a very similar phrase to this, where it, it says, as he is baptized at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. So however that was, that was the best description that could be given. And that landing of the Holy Spirit on Jesus as baptism seems to us, when we look on it in retrospect, to be how he established Jesus as his mouthpiece to, the, to first Israel and then all people for their salvation. So I'm going to go very quickly in the next few seconds because we're going to end early for Father's Day. Let me go down to, uh, this is actually going to be in Luke. Sorry, I had two verses marked. I'm going to go to Luke uh, 23, 44. Luke 23, 44. It's now about the sixth hour. And darkness came over the whole land to the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn to. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Now, this is another one. I don't know of any translation that says he breathed out the Holy Spirit, but I think the implication is he had been given the spirit at baptism. He carried the spirit through his ministry. The spirit was with him through his ministry. And then upon his death here, he gave up that spirit as he had told in John 14 and John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, that he would bestow the Holy Spirit on his followers, his disciples, so that they would be reminded of all he taught and be like his presence with them, they wouldn't be left alone. They would have the presence with them. There's the Holy Spirit. And then bear with me just a few more seconds over at Acts. Uh, let's turn to one and two. And I'll go to Acts one, four. One occasion while he's eating, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So the same phrase for the breath of God and that baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, at chapter two, verse one, when the day of Pentecost came, they're all together in one place. 
Suddenly a sound came like the blowing of violent wind. Does that sound like Ezekiel? Does that sound like the Valley of Bones and the original prophecy chapter one to Ezekiel? The sound came like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Again, I think it's very hard to give a precise description of how the presence of God appears physically, because I think it's beyond the physical on earth. It is uh, difficult to describe. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then, of course, we know the verse over at uh, verse 28, Peter replied, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same phrase of the Holy Spirit landing on the people. So that phrase for the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, weaves all through scripture from before creation through the time of modern day Christianity when we're baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, all through that, the the presence of God at the temple on the Ark of the Covenant, which was then lost, by the way, at Ezekiel 10, when God's presence left, when the glory of God left, the breath of God left the temple, that's when Nebuchadnezzar and his armies came and took all the items away. And despite any documentary you've seen in recent history, the Ark of the Covenant's never been found. And so at the time, in fact, of Jesus cleansing the temple court, for instance, of the mind changers. And then, you know, when the temple curtain was rent uh, at his crucifixion and the presence, our ability to reach the presence of God was opened up by that curtain tear at the death of Jesus on the cross and then his resurrection. There was no Ark of the Covenant in that Holy of Holies because it had been lost to Nebuchadnezzar and his armies. So the literal presence of God was and is everywhere as we've always known but specifically brought I believe through Jesus departing at that time briefly until reappearing at the day of Pentecost and then being present in the baptized Christian today as God with us the breath of God so I hope that makes sense as the interweaving of the Holy Spirit through scripture and then next week, we'll talk a little more about how we understand and can or can understand the presence of the Holy Spirit in ourselves, how that can make a difference in our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you for bearing with me. We are done early by 33 seconds. Have a blessed day.